Okay. Thank you, Dr. Gore. That was excellent. Uh, uh, and good. We're a couple minutes behind, but I, I'd rather stop for um, questions and, and get people's involvement. Uh, and we can fudge a little bit on our break times and, and catch back up. I don't have any, any uh, video display in mind, so John, set the bar high. I should have put you at the end of the day, John. <laughs> Whoops, that's no good. I can log in myself. We need our AV help. Yeah, I'm going to help you on the way. Did control off the lead again and switch to the user? Yeah, it is. <laughs> Yay. Oh. Okay. Okay. Good, good. If we're all set. So, uh, I want to talk for uh, a session today about um, adjuvant therapy for kidney cancer. Um, so what, is that, what does that term adjuvant mean uh, in cancer therapy? Uh, so adjuvant therapy is additional treatment that would be given after primary therapy applied, usually for most cancers implying definitive surgical treatment. So you've taken out a tumor uh, surgically, uh, you're leaving the patient without any identifiable measurable disease. And you know historically, depending on the characteristics of the tumor, the staging that's applied to the tumor, usually you have that data after the surgery is complete. Uh, you know that there's a risk for future recurrence, and the stage distinguishes uh, how much risk. Uh, and so the question then arises, well, can you change that risk? Can you apply a therapy after you recover from surgery um, that's going to decrease the risk of a future disease recurrence? And Typically, we're thinking about primary surgical therapy, and just as Dr. Gore was speaking about, for kidney cancer, surgery on the kidney, taking out the primary tumor. And for adjuvant therapy, usually we're thinking about modalities like radiation therapy or medical therapy. So as a medical oncologist, uh, primarily thinking about what medicines could be applied that would change your future risk of disease recurrence for kidney cancer. So going back to a slide I showed you uh, at the outset, um, that for kidney cancer diagnoses, the majority of patients, the solid majority, have a localized uh, disease. And so uh, most patients are going to undergo a nephrectomy surgery offered as potentially curative therapy for their cancer. So this is going to come up with regularity. Patients are now post-surgery and wanting to know what should come next. Uh, if you look at what's the hazard of recurrence of kidney cancer, this is data from a large uh, national database called SEER. Um, so for in all comers across the board, not thinking about the stage distinction, um, five-year survival rate for kidney cancer is 74%. That's not such a helpful number because we're always going to tease things out in terms of what's your stage of, of diagnosis. In this data set, they didn't use the stage one, two, three, four um, distinctions, but local, regional, or distant spread. And so local kidney cancer is basically going to be stage one or stage two tumors. They're only in the kidney. They're not impinging on some of the associated structures like, like blood vessels and lymph nodes. Uh, and the disease control with surgery is excellent. So at five years, greater than 90% survival uh, in this data set. Regional kidney cancer implies, again, a localized disease process. It's only in the kidney. But now there's something about it that increases the risk of future recurrence. It's beginning to follow the blood vessels. It's in the renal vein. It's growing through. Uh, the kidney tissue proper, and it's into the fat around the kidney. Uh, it's in showing up in lymph nodes associated with the kidney. So the surgeon has still completely removed the tumor, uh, but now you're, you're looking at typically a stage three kidney cancer diagnosis. And in five years, risk of recurrence is, uh, is about uh, 35 to 40 percent. Um, there are later recurrences. I generally quote patients about a 50-50 lifetime risk of recurrence with stage three 
kidney cancer. And then distance disease means at the time of diagnosis you have metastatic disease. And in that setting, in a fairly contemporary cohort, five-year survival only 12%. So that falls into the realm of treating metastatic disease, which isn't, isn't the primary focus of this talk. But depending on your risk, for patients that are considered to have high-risk localized kidney cancer, uh, it's a very valid question. Could you not apply a therapy that's going to change that risk, decrease the risk, and save lives because uh, a subset of patients won't have their cancer come back because you apply an effective therapy? Uh, there are some terms commonly used in research studies uh, that are slightly different, and so I thought it was worth just going through for a moment. Um, what is meant by disease-free survival, if you're looking at a study, versus overall survival? So disease-free survival, at any time point after the study begins, um, a patient that's had surgery, the cancer is removed, and so post-operatively, there's no evidence of cancer, and now you start the clock and you watch that patient moving forward in time, uh, what percent of your population of patients remain without any cancer findings? So you've, you've failed, you're no longer in the disease-free group if your cancer comes back. Doesn't mean that you're dead, uh, you can be living and treating the, the recurrent cancer, but insofar as the cancer comes back, you're no longer in the disease-free population. It's faster to measure disease-free survival than overall survival because as patients have recurrence of their cancer, maybe they can have surgery, maybe they're gonna get medical therapy, there can be a very long time interval from detecting disease recurrence before that cancer may progress and the patient actually dies of that cancer and then becomes an overall survival uh, data point. Uh, but the problem is, what if you apply therapy that delays the time to cancer recurrence, which seems like a good thing, but doesn't ultimately, ultimately prevent the cancer from coming back? So if you wait long enough, everyone destined to have their cancer recur, it ultimately all recurs. And is that really getting you anywhere? Have you gained anything? Uh, because maybe the progressing disease, when it grows back and it's been treated with the medical therapy, is now different. It's more aggressive, it's harder to treat. It's intrinsically resistant to the therapy you applied to try and stop the cancer regrowth. And so maybe you do worse treating that cancer when you can see it on scans and you follow it. So at the end of the day, maybe you really haven't gotten anywhere at all. And, and the natural history of the disease is playing itself out uh, and you really haven't changed anything. And so that is the concern when you look at disease-free survival. Um, is that faithfully giving you insight that you've gained in overall survival? So we prefer to know about overall survival, which is that at any time point, uh, who's alive and who's died. Now, death can be from any cause. You're giving up the fact that it's closely linked to the cancer, but at short time intervals after a cancer diagnosis, one year, two years, three years, even five years, uh, the hazard to the patient is far and away greater for the cancer than for other, other processes. And if you're doing a randomized study, risk of death from other medical conditions should be balanced between groups. Um, so that generally doesn't uh, come into play as being a major concern. And it's really, uh, for an adjuvant therapy, the gold standard applied for most diseases is you want better overall survival if you're truly going to believe that a therapy should be applied and you're really, you're really gaining uh, value for the patient. So just one slide on radiation therapy uh, following nephrectomy. It's an issue that has been looked at, although the data sets are not terribly contemporary. Um, older data, 80s, 1990s. Uh, there are two randomized studies, and then there's a larger meta-analysis that I think most people kind of refer to as being the definitive statement. Um, the two randomized trials pooled with other studies uh, that were retrospective in nature, 735 patients. And the question is, if you apply radiation on recovery from nephrectomy to the surgery bed, do you come out ahead? Do you prevent disease recurrence? Uh, the answer is uh, no. There's no clear survival signal. You're not gaining um, disease control that rises to better survival. And so generally, that's not offered and not done as a routine therapy. Um, so thinking about medical therapy and drug development, the drugs that we have available for kidney cancer, and applying those um, in the adjuvant setting, and we're going to look at where we stand um, with different types of drug therapy. But as you think about the development of a drug for cancers of any kind, including kidney cancer, it has a very stereotypical progression of how the drugs are evaluated. So typically, the first time you try a brand new therapy that has a scientific rationale, it seems like a smart thing to do for a certain cancer, uh, but to prove the point that it actually has value and it can treat the cancer, usually you're going to do a first study in patients that have more or less exhausted good therapies for their cancer. Um, you don't know what you're getting into, you don't know the risk, you don't know if it's going to work. And so patients typically are required to have failed at least one 
or sometimes multiple prior therapies. Uh, and for diseases where there are curative uh, therapies, usually the language of a very first study would require you've exhausted all modalities that might cure your cancer. So uh, ethically, you really need to be um, in unfortunately a bad spot for what's on the table for, for standard cancer therapy to make it worthwhile to embark on something that's quite investigational. For a drug that looks promising, it works well. Maybe it goes all the way forward and gets approved as second or third line therapy for a cancer. If it looks quite compelling, then the question is, well, is this actually the best available therapy for this cancer? And should you start off with this drug and use it right off the bat because it's the most potent drug? So treatments that typically begin at the back end of a list of therapies for cancer then come up and get looked at as perhaps the primary therapy uh, and usually in a comparative fashion. Is the new drug better than what's the current standard? Head-to-head uh, -head, uh, comparison study, typically large, what are called phase three trials. And so drugs that prove to be potent in that setting uh, will almost always then be looked at uh, in a preventative or the adjuvant setting. So here's a drug that works very well for our cancer. We've, we've discovered it. We've proven it has, has value. In fact, it's the most potent drug we have for this cancer. Uh, can it actually work in the preventative setting uh, in patients that have had local therapy and now we're fearful the cancer is going to come back? So that's the general progression, which means the timeline of getting around to the adjuvant questions, usually at the end of the list of doing several studies with, uh, with drugs. And so it's not usually the first question and drugs that have, are newly available, typically you don't know yet what's their, their role in the adjuvant setting. Uh, this is a little schematic that just gives you a broad overview of the drugs that have become available for kidney cancer and how the treatments have changed in their nature and the way they attack the cancer. Um, so if you go back before the mid-1980s, uh, there really was no standard therapy for kidney cancer. It wasn't for lack of trying. There are dozens and dozens of studies of all sorts of chemotherapy agents, hormonal agents, that were very, very ineffective and, and generally uh, not helpful. Uh, in the late 1980s, interferon alpha became available as a therapeutic agent, followed shortly thereafter by interleukin-2. And so those two drugs were called cytokines. They're recombinant versions of hormones your body makes in response to uh, immune stimuli. Worked well enough that they showed benefit and they got FDA approved for treating kidney cancer. And that was standard therapy for a very long time, from early 1990s until 2005. And so we had an era of cytokine therapy for kidney cancer. Uh, the world changed in 2005 with the first approval of an oral targeted therapy. Serafinib was the first drug in class but rapidly followed by several other drugs that were very similar and, in fact, mostly replaced by the other drugs that appeared to be incrementally better. So uh, targeted therapy, which right now is front and center and most patients are receiving uh, these drugs and often multiple of these agents uh, in the same drug family. Um, so the era of targeted therapy. Uh, and then the world changed again in 2015. So November 2015, the FDA approval of nivolumab uh, first in class of what are called immune checkpoint blocking antibodies, the only one so far approved for kidney cancer, but there's several other commercially available similar drugs for other diseases. Uh, so an immunotherapy compound attacking the cancer in a different way, um, and that's uh, the immunotherapy class of drugs is really dominating um, clinical developments and research studies in the last several years. Um, so where do these drugs stand in terms of, of adjuvant therapies? The old cytokine drugs have been looked at and were tested in, in well-designed um, uh, clinical studies looking to see if they have a role in being preventative therapies uh, for kidney cancer. So I show you a couple of these studies uh, listed out that comes from a research paper that shows uh, what's um, uh, called a forest plot, um, so sort of a, a tree-like structure, uh, showing you the relative hazard ratio and the statistical variance of, of uh, those hazard ratios. What that means is what's the relative effect of the treatment arm versus the observation arm. So absolutely no difference. The survival you measure is exactly the same, would be 1.00. Uh, a smaller number would imply the interferon uh, treatment did better or the low dose interleukin-2 plus interferon. A number greater than one implies that observation actually was better than the therapy applied. And then if the variance around the measured value crosses 1.0, uh, it's judged that these differences are not statistically meaningful. And so there's three independent studies, and then they were analyzed in meta-analysis, meaning pooling these results. So 840 patients getting cytokine therapy. 
and there's you know a slight increase above 1.0, but a confidence interval that overlaps 1.0. So the interpretation is no meaningful difference between applying cytokine therapy versus doing nothing at all and just watching patients. So not a helpful intervention. Interleukin-2, back in its day, when it was the only drug available or the only drug with interferon, was uh, experimented in all sorts of regimens and doses. There were low-dose regimens that were outpatient administration, uh, fairly well tolerated. There's a high-dose regimen some of you in this room may have uh, received, far more toxic and unpleasant, requires an inpatient hospital stay. Um, that approach, the high-dose approach with IL-2 has been tested, is in a prophylactic uh, way in a fairly small study, but um, no positive benefit in patients, and that approach uh, has not been, been revisited. Uh, it's certainly not a therapy for everybody. It would be a selected subset of patients, but no hint that that's moving in the right direction. So the cytokines have been looked at in that context and really abandoned as being a useful modality. Uh, what's front and center and data that's beginning to emerge from large uh, clinical studies that take many, many years uh, to organize, to enroll patients, and then to wait and see uh, as the data emerges uh, what you've learned. So, um, you know, in one slide really presenting uh, an impossibly large amount of work, um, hundreds of cancer centers uh, and data collection spanning, you know, a decade or more. So it's really a tremendous amount of efforts. Uh, six studies that have looked at the issue, did the new generation of targeted therapies have a prophylactic role in managing high-risk uh, kidney cancer? So the first study, the ASSURE trial, 2006, and the last study of a similar kind, the ATLAS study, that began in 2012. Uh, all studies, I believe, have enrolled all the patients that they intended, and they're all now just tracking the outcomes of those patients. And three of the six have reported results. And the most recent, uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes on what's called the PROTECT trial, uh, was a study that we participated here at SECA, uh, a randomized study where patients either got the drug pizopinib, also called Votriant, or were receiving a placebo. All of these trials, except for one, gave patients one year duration of the study drug. And so very, very similar structure. You're getting a, a pill. You don't know for sure if it's the real medicine. You're taking it for a year. And then you're being followed um, by a surveillance uh, calendar, very reminiscent of what Dr. Gore talked about that would be consistent with, with treatment guidelines um, to see what happens uh, to the two different patient groups. <clears throat> uh, the, third, the last trial here, the ATLAS trial, is going to treat patients for three years with axitinib. Um, so a little bit of, of insider insight. The company that makes axitinib owns sunitinib and undoubtedly had insight that the one year of sunitinib was proving to be unhelpful. And so they decided to do a, a different experiment and go longer. Um, so we'll see if that's meaningful. But let's just take a look at some of the uh, results. This was the ASCO meeting in Chicago, June 2017, first public release of results with pizopinib. And one figure uh, I particularly liked that I think gives you a graphic impression of, you know, what are we asking of you as the patient? These medicines are not uh, innocent drugs. They come with side effects. Uh, people don't feel well. And this is a quality of life questionnaire patients filled out over the timeline of uh, the PROTECT trial. So the placebo patients that were taking nothing, just a fake pill, uh, are the yellow line here. And so they felt normal, they felt fine, and this score value, 0, 0.0, that's your baseline. Patients taking the true drug, pizopinib, felt lousy for a full year on therapy, but as therapy ends, then they, you know, the side effects go away and they go back to feeling fine. But this, you know, this drop off in quality of life that's given a quantitative metric that's, that's arbitrary, I just think that's a lovely graphic representation, that it's not a free ride. Uh, you're taking a year worth of drug that's making you feel lousy for years, you know, kind of a long time. So that's a lot of effort and work um, and bother. And so what is the gain? Well, the gain is so far absolutely nothing at all, unfortunately. When you look at the survival curves uh, of the two treatments, um, placebo or pizopinib, they're almost completely overlapping and there's no statistical difference between these curves. So the gold standard test, the overall survival benefit of this drug was absolutely nothing. The disease-free survival, which was also captured and measured also, was judged to be statistically uh, not different. And so uh, unfortunately, a negative study and not showing benefit uh, for pizopinib. And to summarize, uh, So yes, good question. You had to have localized disease and high enough risk to judge it to be worthwhile. And so 
Um, I didn't print out the enrollment eligibility. For most of these trials, all stage three patients were eligible. For many of the trials, you could be stage two, but then you had to have other features. The nuclear grading scale on your pathology report had to be a high grade tumor, usually grade three or grade four from stage two, and then any stage three uh, is the usual cut point um, by and large for the different, different studies. So if you look at uh, the three different large trials that have now been presented uh, in terms of outcomes, the ASSURE trial actually had three different treatment arms. It had uh, sunitinib, which is sutent. It had serafinib, nexavar. Those were given as separate independent therapies, not given together. And then placebo. So three different treatment groups in that study, uh, a very, very large study, 1,900 patients. And there was no disease-free benefit and no survival benefit, so a completely negative experience um, delivering those drugs for one year of therapy. Uh, first to report with this approach, very, very disappointing for the field, I must say. Uh, people were, were you know, very optimistic with this approach before the data began to be released. Last fall, the S-TRAC study presented its results, and curiously, uh, it's a second study with SUTENT, um, and that did show a statistical benefit of disease-free survival, but so far, overall survival shows no difference. And so that's the odd dichotomy are you just delaying the inevitable, and are you really getting anywhere? Um, and so I think most people in the field will hold the study to showing a survival benefit before they would be moved to think that you should be um, recommending SU10 for patients. But it's very puzzling that the same clinical experiment was done twice and came to a different conclusion. And in all honesty, there's really no explanation for that. There's people have sort of hemmed and hawed over what was done differently and was it meaningful, but um, you know there just isn't an explanation. Uh, and then the PROTECT trial, brand new data from a month ago, uh, negative for disease-free survival, negative overall survival. So I think, you know, the bulk of evidence, three different experiments, uh, different drugs, similar approach, a year of therapy, and it doesn't seem like we're getting anywhere with targeted therapy as adjuvant treatment. So we certainly have not adopted trying to use any of these drugs in the adjuvant setting as standard of care. None of them are FDA approved to be used in that fashion either, so you couldn't easily write a prescription for patients even if you wanted to go that route. So if we go back to our, our schematic here, um, so we've crossed cytokines off the list as not being helpful. We're right in the thick of learning about the utility of the targeted therapies. There's still trials that haven't been complete, but we're becoming quite pessimistic that uh, you'd think if any of these drugs work, they probably all would work. And so uh, a couple of negative trials have really poisoned um, the field. And I think at this point, nobody's really expecting that the pending trials are likely to be dramatically positive. Um, so what's coming next? What's coming next is taking uh, the new class of drugs, the immunotherapy drugs, and doing the same experiment and seeing what happens there. So just uh, a quickie cartoon um, about what do we think we're doing, what's the biology of the new generation immunotherapy drugs. Um, starting down here on the left, we know that tumors uh, are abnormal cells. Uh, many of the cells within a tumor mass are dying, even though the tumor is growing larger. So it's creating... Um, material that's picked up by the immune system, which is the scavenger system, getting rid of dead cells. And there are immune cells whose job it is is to show the immune system material that's being chewed up uh, and, and metabolized to make sure there's nothing there that's abnormal. And so the uh, important cell in your immune system that can actually detect an abnormal cell like a tumor cell and turn on and react to it is called a T lymphocyte or T cell. So that's central to the biology of what we think is happening spontaneously, but just not happening and working to a vigorous degree that's curing the cancer. When T cells turn on, they turn on a whole uh, organized program of, of gene expression. They become activated where they can recognize and kill off a target, which is good, but they turn on uh, a mechanism to shut the whole system down so it doesn't go crazy and, and damage normal tissues. And so as T cells activate and go out and find targets, they begin to express uh, proteins that can shut them off. And one of those is called the PD-1 protein that's on activated T cells. So T cells that are inside of tumor tissue and crawling around and hopefully giving you uh, an anti-tumor effect can encounter the binding partner for PD-1 called the protein PD-L1. PD-L1 can be made by the tumor itself. So the tumor shields itself, it defends itself by making a protein that can turn off immune cells right at the point of action where the T cell is bumping up against tumor cells. And so blocking this interaction on either side of the equation, either blocking the PD-1 protein or blocking the PD-L1 protein, 
uh, represents this family of what are called immune checkpoint drugs, and they're proving to be widely effective across numerous different tumors and becoming some of the most widely used drugs across cancer in general and can work quite well in some kidney cancer patients. So what's coming and is going to be looked at now in the next few years is applying these drugs in the adjuvant setting uh, in large studies, uh, several hundred patients, and trying to prove the point that these drugs do or don't have a prophylactic role uh, in the setting of kidney cancer. Uh, there's a similar drug that's not listed here, a drug called Yervoy or Ipilimumab that's FDA approved for melanoma that has had a positive adjuvant study in, in melanoma patients. And so that's definitely um, you know, encouraging people to think that this drug class may be unique and different and better than the other types of drugs that have been tested and will actually show us a true benefit in this setting, but it's going to take several years um, to collect and then wait and analyze the data. Uh, there's four studies that are all overlapping each other and open and enrolling at the same time. Uh, the EMOTION trial is using the drug atezolizumab. The PROSPER trial, a drug called nivolumab, which is an FDA-approved drug for kidney cancer. The keynote study using pembrolizumab, or you may know that as Keytruda. And then the CHECKMATE trial is combining nivolumab with ipilimumab, or your voice, so a two-drug cocktail. The only study that's combining uh, more than one drug in this setting. It wouldn't make sense for a single cancer center to have all these studies open because they're redundant. They're recruiting the same uh, patients, high-risk patients, uh, high-risk stage two and stage three patients with kidney cancer. So at our center, we were, have the good fortune of choosing amongst these and are going to open the keynote trial, that's uh, Keytruda, or pembrolizumab trial. Uh, that's in process, should be opening later in 2017. And so anticipating that study will take anywhere from one to two years to enroll patients. We will have a chunk of time where we'll have the opportunity for patients to participate in a study uh, to maybe get a prophylactic immunotherapy drug, recognizing it's randomized and blinded. So 50-50 chance you're getting the true drug versus just a saline placebo infusion. So you have to be okay with that scenario. So where do we stand for adjuvant therapy? Um, you know, there could have been one slide with the big red slash. Uh, there is no uh, FDA-approved, uh, proven effective adjuvant therapy for kidney cancer, despite um, lots of well-done uh, large studies uh, trying to identify an effective approach. So standard of care at this day and age continues to remain uh, ongoing surveillance for patients. Uh, with no recommended um, active therapy. Uh, there are pending studies that are complete and we're just waiting for the data to mature with targeted therapies. So there's the chance that one of these drugs will uh, show a benefit and actually come into the field as a possible therapy for patients. But so far, results are disappointing. Um, and so we're, the field's getting fairly pessimistic uh, that it's gonna bear fruit uh, with targeted therapy. And then the immunotherapy trials uh, are just getting up and going. So it's going to be several years before we have an answer. But that will be something that's at least available and ready in prime time for patients. Is there a Question? downside to the immunotherapy um, treatment side effects? So yes, nothing, unfortunately, is, is risk-free. Right. Um, you know, although we like the immunotherapy drugs for our patients and think they're quote, unquote, well tolerated, uh, there is a side effect profile, uh, 10 to 12 percent of patients in the metastatic setting will be forced to stop therapy for so-called intolerable side effects. Uh, there's even the risk of, of side effects escalating to being a cause of death in upwards of 1 or 2 percent of patients in the metastatic uh, treatments. Uh, patients that have, you know, metastatic cancer are motivated to do something about their cancer and are willing to, you know, assume a greater risk. Uh, it's an awful experience to take somebody that is completely healthy, has negative scans for cancer, put them on a therapy that makes them severely ill or they even die from uh, the attempt to treat their cancer and prevent that because you don't know if they're destined to ever have their cancer come back. So it's a whole different world where your tolerance for risk and toxicity is quite different in an otherwise healthy cancer-free group of patients, at least at the outset of therapy. Um, and that definitely comes into play about this panel of studies. Um, there's not a huge amount of difference between the different drugs, but perhaps some slight differences. But the one approach where you're combining two drugs together clearly increases your chance for bad side effects. And so that, um, you know, myself and my colleagues looking at our opportunities um, was something we discussed. And uh, we're fearful about, based on our experience with our melanoma patients, the um, Yervoy therapy for melanoma 
is given at an unconventional high dose, and the side effect profile is fairly uh, uh, extreme. Um, and we have had patients that came into that treatment completely healthy and had really terrible problems. Um, and that's, again, that's a very uh, awful situation. So we'd like to think pembrolizumab generally goes pretty smooth, but there definitely will be a subset of patients where it causes um, some pretty unpleasant side effects, uh, hopefully not arising to the level of patients actually dying. Um, statistically, most patients are likely to have mild or no side effects, but uh, it's, again, it's not risk-free. Question here? So the, uh, the data for that approval came largely from a trial called the Checkmate 025 study. Um, so a randomized phase three trial, nivolumab, was compared to uh, an approved drug called Affinitor or Everolimus head-to-head 50-50 and was the better drug for the anti-tumor effects. It was actually the better drug for patient preference and side effects as well. Um, so that was most of the data. Uh, this, company bundles smaller precursor studies as well into their um, filing with the FDA. Uh, that study probably took about three years to complete, I think. The timeline of the immunotherapy drugs um, was really brief. Uh, the movement through advanced clinical testing was very rapid, um, in part for the enthusiasm with these drugs and in part for the competition uh, from other companies that had similar drugs and knowing that they were clearly effective and were going to be uh, winners and get through the FDA, there was a lot of um, intense pressure to try and beat the next guy uh, and get your study done. So it went very quickly. Uh, the average timeline from a new drug being tested in the clinic to FDA approval has historically been eight to ten years. Uh, the FDA has tried to accelerate that, and so something more like five to six years in contemporary uh, uh, time is probably more typical. So a three, three and a half year timeline is actually really quite short. So these studies are all for um, localized kidney cancer, so stage, uh, some stage two and stage three patients, um, trying to be preventative therapy. Uh, nivolumab is approved for advanced for stage four kidney cancer. Uh, its approval right now says you had to have had a prior therapy that's no longer working, like Sutent or Votriant. There are studies that have been completed but haven't been reported where nivolumab was given as primary therapy, first therapy for kidney cancer. If those studies are positive, then it'll change its FDA guidance and you'll be able to prescribe it as the initial therapy for patients. So that's uh, pending data. The word on the street is maybe as early as late 2017, we'll have uh, the first frontline study uh, presented publicly. Uh, and that may change the use of, of nivolumab. So once a drug is FDA approved and it's being prescribed to patients, there's no, there's no active data collection. Um, so the broader experience uh, isn't you know, being actively measured and quantified. Uh, there are mechanisms where physicians can report to the FDA uh, particularly bad or unusual side effects. So the FDA does have a reporting mechanism. And in fact, physicians get these, these letters soliciting um, uh, data entry and data collection for patients that report side effects, I believe, to the dispensing pharmacy. Uh, you get a call, and if you tell the pharmacy contact that you've had certain side effects, that they send off uh, a note to the FDA that triggers a mailing to the prescribing physician. Trying to collect that data, trying to get real world side effect experience, but it's highly imperfect. There's no obligation for the doctor to actually send that data in. I can just throw that in the trash and, and ignore it. Um, so it, it's highly imperfect. Uh, question in the back? I just wanted to clarify, sir. After the study is done and the FDA has approved the, the drug, there is no more data after that? So, so right. For any doctor prescribing a treatment as a standard therapy because of FDA approval, what happens to you is not actively collected right. uh, unless you're participating in a study. So for example, 
Um, the company that owns nivolumab, after the FDA approval, did another study uh, that we participated in that included patients that weren't part of, of the study that gained FDA approval. So that study only allowed, for example, clear cell histology as your diagnosis. They did an add-on study and they allowed any kidney cancer diagnosis. So papillary kidney cancers, chromophobe kidney cancers could receive the drug. Um, even though the FDA doesn't restrict the use to clear cell, so you could have prescribed it for a patient as standard of therapy. If you put them on the study, then you know the data is being collected and it'll be analyzed. And you'll learn something about patients that were part of the patient experience uh, that was the data leading up to FDA approval. But you have to be formally enrolled in a study to have the data collected and actually analyzed. Uh, for most people, it's simply standard of care therapy, and it's, it's not something that's being collected. So yes, so most studies, there's active therapy, but if that active therapy ends, we'll still track and monitor what happens to patients for disease status, new scans, overall survival. Um, unless the study closes down and simply says, okay, we're done, that's all the data we're going to collect. Or a lot of times, you'll be monitored unless you start on some alternate cancer therapy. And then at that point in time, you leave the study for any ongoing assessment because they assume now that's going to muddy the waters. It's hard to judge what their drug has accomplished because now you're receiving some other treatment. So that's a common transition for a study. You're monitored if you're not doing any active therapy. You're part of the study. But then if you receive a next treatment, then you leave the study formally at that point. Um, but ongoing outcome for overall survival as a long, long tail for research studies is very common. Question in the back? Um, so, I mean, a good portal is, is your doctor, um, but, you know, lo most community physicians have very limited or no clinical trials, um, so they may or may not be very uh, aggressive in, in helping you find stuff. There is an excellent web portal. Um, this clinicaltrials.gov is uh, the most comprehensive listing site for clinical trials of all kind. Uh, it is kind of daunting if you search for something and you get 50 or 100 or 500 clinical trials that populate a list that you pull up. How do you weed that down to things that are actually relevant? But that might be an area where you, know, you could meet with your doctor and, and help sort through things you're interested in or things that you've found. Um, you know, a cancer center like ours where a big part of our mission and our goal is to participate in research. Um, ideally, we're going to know, we're going to have things here, but if we don't have it, we could tell you uh, in a fairly educated way what might be available to you in the greater Northwest or, you know, nationally if, if it's in the cards that you travel to some fairly far off cancer center. Uh, research trials are always linked to the participating center, and so if you went for an opinion at MD Anderson or Sloan Kettering or Cleveland Clinic and they had a trial that sounded really exciting, you usually can't export that and come back home and be in the study and be here in Seattle. You have to work with that cancer center as you're treating doctors, the doctors analyzing your scans, collecting your data. So you basically have to either commute or live in that city. And so for most people, that's not really in the cards. But for a few folks, you have friends, you have family, you can actually come and go to Houston or some city that has a cancer center that's doing something that's interesting to you. It might be feasible. Um, but that's an unfortunate feature of the clinical trial process. Uh, question here. Relative to this chart you have, uh, where does your current Avilimab uh, fit in trial uh, fit into the picture? So that study is, uh, is for metastatic disease. So first line therapy for patients with stage four disease. This is all for patients with localized kidney cancer. So stage two or stage three. So different subset of patients. Like take some of these trials and quickly uh, 
uh, get to the bottom of whether there would be a positive outcome or not. And, and with, the, with the question in the back also, um, I, was, I was doing some research and it turns out that usually about studies that come out per week are more than, than a, the, the research center can, can um, digest. So uh, some, some research centers are using IBM Watson to, to get a more global view of, you know, this is the 10,000 uh, trials that happened this week, so people have access to um, all the, the insurmountable amount of information that needs to be di digested and then point to uh, different uh, possibilities for their individual treatment. Well, you, you touch on a number of, of issues. Um, the idea of how can you quickly figure out what might be the best therapy comes into play so with the immun immunotherapy drugs that are available, there's, there's a zillion similar drugs, related drugs, other immune stimulating drugs. And so right now the field is fascinated with combinations. Give one of these drugs plus something else. And how can you quickly figure out which ones are fruitful, which ones are not going anywhere? And that's a very difficult task. Uh, the company that owns Nivolumab has piloted uh, what they perceive to be a strategy to rapidly work through a whole series of two drug combinations in a more efficient way than the usual mechanism um, uh, called the fraction protocols for different diseases. We'll see how that works out. Uh, on the one hand, you know, investigators that are specialists, you know, there's not an uh, unlimited number of, of drugs that have enough data that you know they're clearly working. And so, um, having a feel for what should be looked at in a, in a definitive large study I don't think is, is something that you can't sort out fairly uh, easily. But what you touch on is, you know, the universe of all possible clinical trials is immense. Every time I go on clinicaltrials.gov and search for something that I know about, I hit on all of these studies that I never even knew existed, that I look at them and I'm like, oh, that's pretty cool. We'd like to have that. Um, <laughs> So it is, there is this massive world of studies uh, and any one cancer center can't possibly participate or even really, you know, know in completion what's out there and available. But, you know, pragmatics are that you'd have to travel and go to different cancer centers all over the country if you want to participate in these different studies. I mean, there, there is what's available in your own backyard, but then there's this massive world of other things that you might be interested in. So for the person that they're not limited, you know, in travel, in time, and could actually truly search the entire country for an interesting study, uh, that is a very daunting task. And even your local oncologist probably isn't completely up on every last thing you could find in a web portal like this. And that's, I don't have a perfect answer for that. There are commercial uh, clinical search services that will help you identify relevant studies and help contact centers find out if they're actually open and enrolling. I have had a few patients bring in uh, lists provided by services to help them right. try and identify studies. So that might be uh, something useful. But most people are limited by the reality that if they saw things in other places, they just, it's not feasible. It would be like a, uh, an IBM Watson portal that I could, you know, and it would learn and you know, take advantage of the in, embed and embed you know, learning that has come from some of these research uh, places and then point to that right there. Yeah. This can be uh, something that you invent. So uh, we'll see you on Shark Tank uh, spinning your, your idea. I mean, it's, it is, yeah, it, it's, it's a great topic. Um, I don't, don't have a perfect answer. So for any study you participate in, if you're actively working with us and we know results have been published, we try and tell you that you know, there's public announcement of your study and what things look like. I don't think the study mechanism itself necessarily contacts you and like would send you a participant letter announcing that you know, here's the results of your trial that have just been published. I think it's kind of on the, the doctor to tell you. Uh,
Well, yes. I mean, the goal of these studies is to identify an effective therapy that then gains FDA approval, then everyone can use it and prescribe it. So, um, you know, every oncologist should be on guard for new definitive studies that are going to change practice and new FDA approvals so they can change the care for their patients. And so that should be something that, you know, any good oncologist is aware of. Um, but actually participating in the research study, you know in advance the study's coming and maybe you're even involved in it as the participant versus the day that there's the FDA announcement of an approval. Um, you know, people are already expecting that and know that and know the study was complete and results were discussed. So that's kind of late in the game. That shouldn't be brand new, shocking news to anybody. When that announcement finally comes along, that just opens the door that you can now prescribe it and insurance will pay for it. So we're a couple minutes behind our target. Why don't we take 10 minutes, 11.05, we'll come back uh, and jump into the, the next two sessions before the lunch break. <laughs>